Valentine's Day Husker fans. This is the Pick 6 Podcast. Sam McEwen along with Tom Chattel and Evan Bland will soon be going down to Texas for the start of the Nebraska baseball season. Uh, gentlemen, happy Valentine's Day to you guys. I hope you're doing well on this Wednesday. Happy yes, Valentine's sir. Day, yeah. Love it. Again. All right, so we're going to get rolling. Um, we will go to Nebraska baseball at the end. We'll have about a 15-minute uh, preview at the end of the podcast uh, for folks that are really ready for baseball. Yes, it's actually here, um, here in mid-February. Um, off the top, we're going to talk a little bit of Big Ten offseason football. Roster reset, coaching reset. Coaching roster appears set now in the Big Ten with uh, Deshaun Foster taking the job at UCLA after Chip Kelly decided to join Ryan Day at Ohio State. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit to, about that. We'll also talk about Nebraska basketball, uh, which is in the middle of their bye week. Uh, Wilson Moore, uh, who has the half-court press uh, podcast with John Walker, will talk about the NCAA tournament stuff. Nebraska's right on the bubble. Uh, and then, of course, we'll talk baseball. want to mention off the top, uh, tough news uh, for Jordy Ball, uh, the Nebraska softball pitcher who uh, injured her knee in the third inning of the season opener last week for Nebraska softball. It really stinks. Um, Tom, I thought you wrote a really nice piece coming out of uh, coming out of the an uh, the announcement of that injury yesterday. Um, certainly a superstar that, uh, that that's going to have to wait a whole calendar year before she can she can show what she can do for Nebraska fans. So that was a tough moment, I think, for Husker softball. Tom, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to what you wrote. No, just the uh, emotions of it right now are, are all you can feel because we never. I mean, she she pitched three innings and then it was over. It, um, I you know, sometimes these things happen in sports, not very often, but uh, where somebody of her stature doesn't get to play, you know, you you don't get to see what would have happened, and um, maybe it reminded me a little bit of. Uh, Aaron Rodgers a little bit, you know, yeah. like, you know, a lot of hype, a lot of hope and expectations. And, but I believe uh, she, she can still make it better. She can still help the team. She can, she can help, she can help coach them on the bench and, you know, raise the standards um, little by little and um, hopefully come back next year uh, as good as ever. Amen to that. Outside chance for Nebraska to make the NCAA tournament. I mean, they they have a pitcher in Kaylin Kenny who 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 can get the job done. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, their schedule is very hard, and so um, they'll have to play really really well over the next month or so to put themselves in position or win the Big Ten tournament. Now uh, that's what's what I think they're going to have to do, and uh, it's going to be obviously challenging without Jordy. All right, let's move on to Nebraska football and Big Ten football. Glenn Thomas talked this week off the top on Monday for about 20 minutes about the Husker quarterbacks. Then Matt Rule was on the radio Tuesday night uh, to talk about, you know, retaining Tony White again uh, because Tony White did not get the UCLA job. Deshaun Foster, uh, one of Tony White's former teammates when the two played for the Bruins in the late 90s, did get the job. And so it would appear, although you never quite know in this sport, that the coaching roster for the Big Ten in 2024 – when it expands to 18 teams, uh, adding USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon, it'll appear that the coaching roster is set. Now, these way too early top 25s don't mean much, of, if anything. I, I know that. I'm, I'm keenly aware. But I did find it notable, and I didn't know if you guys thought about this at all or not, but ESPN came out with its, its preseason top 25. They updated it to account for departures and other things like that. And... In its preseason top 25, I'm not kidding, there were more Big 12 teams in it than there were Big 10 teams in it. And the Big 10 teams that were in it were Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, and Oregon, and that was it. USC wasn't there. Washington wasn't there. UCLA wasn't there. In the Big 12, it was Kansas State, Oklahoma State, Kansas, Arizona, who is new. I can't remember who the, the other team was. Utah. Utah, which I think was the highest rated of the teams. So Utah and Arizona, the additions over there. Um, so I guess here's here's where I'll start start the question. 
the Big Ten has now expanded to 18 teams. Um, I think you have a pretty good sense of who the coaches are going to be. A lot of young, new coaches, certainly in the league. Um, and it, it appears that what we thought this league might be even six months ago isn't going to quite be what it is now. Like, it just seems like a, a different first year for the Big Ten. Well, I, I don't have a big problem with the Big 12 having uh, more. I don't – but I think that the, the – the quality of the, the big the Big Ten teams is, is probably better than the Big Twelve. I just think that um, Oregon is is going to be is going to be a, a, the best of any of them probably. Um, Ohio State, we don't know much about the quarterback situation <clears throat> yet. Uh, Michigan is going to rebuild, obviously, um, but you know, you, you, I I think the Penn State is. Is going to be up there. Um, I really don't know who else who else you would have put in the Big Ten. Maybe uh, Wisconsin. I don't yeah, know. I mean, it's, uh, I it's reflective for sure. I don't really know anybody. I think it's just sort of the state of the Big Ten right now. That there's a lot going on. That there there's still new coaches at, at places that are trying to build. Um, you know, Washington is uncertain. Uh, UCLA. I didn't think they they were a factor anyway. I mean, even even when they had Chip Kelly to come in here and do anything. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't make too much out of that. I think um, but when it boils down to it, though, and I'll I'll, I'll put my name on this. Um, the Big Twelve is just going to get one playoff bid, and the Big Ten will get more. And so, whatever the rankings are, the way it's going to turn out is it's going to be better for the Big Ten than. The, the the Big 12 in the playoff. What do you think, Evan? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with all that. I think top to bottom, the Big 10's going to be deeper. I mean, obviously it has more teams than the Big 12, but I just think the quality puts it a little bit deeper. Um, you know, you can make an argument for a number of other teams that can prove themselves. Uh, Iowa obviously has been there a lot. Uh, Washington, we don't know. USC, maybe. Wisconsin, end of the season on a, on a somewhat high note. So you can, you can go a different direction there, but yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting sort of moment in time where like you, you hear the talk about the power two and how the sec and the big 10 are pulling away in terms of resources and television exposure. And I think it's just a reminder that in this moment, there aren't a lot of dominant teams. I mean, Ohio state <laughs> spent, spent, spent and reloaded uh, like Tom said, I agree. I think Oregon's probably the favorite at this point. You don't know what to expect with Michigan resetting. Can Penn State take the next jump? So there's a lot of a lot of questions. Um, even in a league with so many resources, I think it just speaks to, you know, first of all, how hard it is to win, but also how hard it is to be sustainable in this era of NIL and the transfer portal. It's it's hard. It's it's more than just having a good coach. Like a lot of things have to align. Uh, you have to rebuild this thing year to year. And I think that's reflective a little bit in, in those rankings. In case you're wondering, the ESPN had the ESPN. What am I saying? ESPN had 10 SEC teams in that top 25. Hmm. 10. So 10 SEC, uh, five, five Big 12, four Big 10, and I think four ACC. There were no group of five teams. And one of the group of five teams, as everyone knows, will be in the playoff next year. Um, it's almost certain they're going to vote on this, I think, February 20th, and it's going to be five conference champions. Well, you know, that fifth conference champion uh, is going to be a group of five champion. So, you know, it, <laughs> I don't know that they made any room for that team, but um, but that team will be ranked. Uh, you know, here's, here's what I would say. You swapped out Jim Harbaugh, Kalen DeVore, and Chip Kelly. And you replace them with Jed Fish at, at, at Washington. I think Fish is a good coach. Um, but he went to Washington. And then you have two newcomers, Sharon Moore and Deshaun Foster at Michigan and UCLA. And th th that's a pretty significant shift. Um, you know, Harbaugh is an odd duck, I you know, but he makes everywhere he goes better. So, Tom, your Chargers are going to be getting better now that they have Jim Harbaugh. And Michigan's probably not going to be quite as good. I mean, they're going to be... They'll be maybe, uh, you know, they'll they'll probably take a dip. Um, what was striking to me is that at the same time now, because they're kind of, again, they kind of wait until everything settles, and then Vegas, right around the time of the Super Bowl, will put out the, the initial win totals. 
for each team in the league. And Ohio State and Oregon were right at the top. I, I'm with Tom. I actually favor Oregon right now over Ohio State. Other people don't agree. You know, they'll say Ohio State over Oregon. But those two teams at the top, but Nebraska's seven and a half. Well, the um I, you know, Michigan and and UCLA uh went the safe route, uh, maybe because they had to in some ways. I think UCLA needed the coach. Um could they have hired Tony White? I think they went, yeah, I think they um or I, I guess PJ Fleck was in the mix, who knows? Um the that would have been you know fun to see him out there in Westwood uh, next to Hollywood, but um some of that some of the stuff he says. But um I think they went safe because in the in a transfer portal era, you don't want half your team leaving. And I think the reaction uh when you saw Foster going to the team room when they introduced him as the new head coach, the reaction was very positive, and you know the, the players love him. So I think, and I think the same thing at Michigan. Um, I think Michigan and UCLA went safe, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but they may have gone safe when maybe a few years from now they won't go safe. Right. Because in this league, you can't afford to go safe. You have to go big. Um, you have to win. So, I, you know, to me, the interesting thing about um, Ohio State is there everything is, you know, there uh, everything uh, the focus is always on Michigan. They've lost three in a row. They've got those guys coming into their place this year. The, you know, they they want revenge. They want to turn it back. The game of the year is when Ohio State goes to Eugene. Yeah. That's in early October. Are they going to be ready for that? Because they're used to that. The, their, their body clocks say late November, game of the year. Yeah, game of the year this year, Eugene, Oregon, long plane ride, early October. Um, so I think, I, I mean, that's the game of the year in the Big 12, in the, the Big 10 this year. So yes. um, can they are they ready for that? Um, interestingly, does Chip Kelly help them? Having him on the staff help them against Oregon. I don't know, um, but it's all it's all very interesting, I guess. Um, but yeah, Nebraska seven point five. Uh, I believe when I see it, I'm, I'm still not willing to go there. I want to see six before I before I talk about seven. So, but I I I do expect Nebraska to be better this year in every way. Um, I think the coaching staff is focused. And I think the the culture is focused. It's in place. And now they're lighting a fire to be better. And I think Tony White is maybe the 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 higher of the year, offseason higher of the year is having Tony White come back. So yeah. um but you know, I don't know what Evan feels, but seven point five it's great. I can't go there until I see six. Yeah, I mean seven and a half half is is a lot, I guess. You know, if you're talking about setting over unders, then to me the next step is to look at the games and be like, okay, how many games is Nebraska going to be the favorite in? And it's probably seven or so. I don't know, maybe maybe Colorado at home as well. But and of course it's it's so front loaded in the thing. So like to me, it's all about how do you get this thing started? If it's Dylan Riola, you know how how what's his learning curve like? Are you able to take care of business at home while you're figuring things out and getting better? You know, if you if you split those first six games, I think that's a worst case scenario, quite honestly, for Nebraska with what they have on the back end. So, I'm with you. If I were a betting person, and I'm not, but if I were, uh, that seems like a pretty big leap, um, just because we haven't seen it. And I agree with Tom. I think they're going to be better in a lot of ways on the lines of scrimmage. Certainly, a quarterback. Uh, I think they upgraded from a staff perspective, but. You just can't go, can't make that leap, I don't think, until you see it. And how many years now has it been when you can look on paper and, and you just sort of assume that Nebraska will take care of business against certain teams, and it rarely does. So it's, uh, you know, it's tempting to go into that trap. I can't do it either, though I think, uh, you know, probably that six to seven win range is pretty reasonable. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, a note a note on UCLA here just really quickly. UCLA plays six road games next year because they play Hawaii 
as well, which allows them to add a home game, and they will with Fresno State, which is a, a really tough opponent uh, to play uh, for your add-on game. They also play at LSU, Penn State, Rutgers, Nebraska, and Washington. And they play Rutgers and Nebraska back-to-back uh, -back on the road. So the schedule for UCLA is, is as hard as anything I've seen. Oh, by the way, they also play Oregon and USC and Iowa. It's the hardest schedule maybe in college football. Uh, so, you know, UCLA is probably going to have a hard year, uh, whatever, whatever happens. Maybe Chip Kelly knew that. Didn't want to deal with it. Didn't want to deal with going out to Hawaii to open the season, all the other stuff that goes along with it. Um, I do think that Nebraska's got to – here's probably the way I would put it. I agree that you got to see six before you see anything else, so I agree with Tom there. What I would also say is that I think everybody around Nebraska's football program is talking about urgency, not just because, you know, hey, everybody wants to win, but I think everybody sees a real opportunity to start that year. Uh, there, there, There appears to be – you know, a chance and, and, and nobody's going to sit there and, 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 you know, cry about any of the opponents that you face. But when I rattle off UTEP, Colorado, Northern Iowa, Illinois, and then I tell you that you get your first month at home, I think everybody feels like, okay, well, that's a start. And then your next, and then your first road games at Purdue, and you're going to have 10,000 fans there. And then you get Rutgers at home and then you go to Indiana. The, the, this is, this is how you want to set a season up. I mean, you can't, you can never count a win for sure. Iowa women's basketball counted a win on Sunday, three quarters into the game, and then they lost. So um, you can never do it. But at the same time, uh, I think there's there's a sense around Nebraska football where there, there could be a real chance to get it done. I want to ask one more question about the Big Ten, and then we'll, then we'll move on to Nebraska men's basketball. So Michigan is has won 40 games in the last three years. Uh, I think it's unprecedented in the history of the Big Ten. And Jim Harbaugh's gone. And I'm just curious. I mean, this is the team that was the favorite of the Big Ten the last three years, dominant in the league, lost, lost one league game to Michigan State in 2021. Um, is it possible that what we're about to see is something similar to what happened to Nebraska after Tom Osborne left and Frank Stolich took over? And it just felt like as good of a job as Stolich might have done, it wasn't the same. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think it's, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know not enough about Michigan staff. Not really that it's been rated by Harbaugh. Um, but I, I, I think Sharon is, is, uh, has not been in Michigan long enough. Like, like, like so much was the entire staff. Uh, stayed so, and 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 frankly, the the years after Osborne left were 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 good years. <laughs> the four years after he left were good years. So, um, yeah, I, the one thing I like about the Michigan uh, coach is he's an offensive line guy, and you need offensive line in the Big Ten. So he he's gonna he, they're gonna have that part figured out. They're not going. To, they're not going to have to replace anything uh, in terms of the system, or you know, they, they probably they've got players that are coming in. It's going to be a priority. Um, you know, the thing Harbaugh, and it took him a while to figure this out. Now, he he won, but it took him a while to beat Ohio State and get it figured out. But he needed offensive line, and he needed the quarterback. He didn't have a, he didn't have either one for the first three or four years of that of his uh, era there. So it's, it's that's what it's about, man. Quarterback and offensive line. Uh, and you're in good shape. So um, I, I don't know what to – I mean, I, we have to look at the Big Ten differently. We can't just look at it like Michigan being Michigan and Ohio State. And There's four teams coming in that, that are going to jumble things up. And, and um, the Big Ten is going to have to get used to them as much as they're going to have to get used to the Big Ten. So, mm -hmm. because there are four of them, it doesn't just Nebraska coming in. Well, Nebraska's going to take over the league, blah blah blah. Uh, no, they're not. But four of them, and they're they're it's it's a it's a, it's a foursome that has a lot of clout and has a lot of history, um, yes. and a lot of players, and they're not like Nebraska. 
in 2010 or 11, where they're, they weren't they, they aren't equipped to deal with the Big Ten. Uh, these guys are at least Washington and Oregon are. So, um, but we'll see. But yeah, as far as Michigan and the, I, I don't think there's a, a comparison there necessarily. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to see how long they stay with this guy. Um, is it is it just about beating Mich- Ohio State now, or is it about going to the playoff? It's a whole new era now where we're going to judge ourselves in the Big Ten. Not by the Rose Bowl or winning the big the big game, it's who's going to the playoff. So Michigan will be judged by the playoff. UCLA will be judged by the playoff, and we'll see how long those guys last. Again, I thought that they were stopgap hires, probably smart hires right now. Pull things together. Um, they went safe, but in the future, in the Big Ten, you can't go safe. So this may be just a two or three year deal for for, for each one of those schools. I would I would just add too, like I th- I think it'll be fascinating. And Michigan's an example of this. I think Alabama's an example of this, where like what does how 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 down can a traditional power get in today's climate? Like, yeah, you're changing your head coach, but like if you have an NIL structure in place and all the rest, like does that curb some of what we've seen through college football history where a a, a school like Nebraska uh you know, has fallen into some tough years and tough decades. I don't know. Or or maybe it, it, it accentuates it where like the coach is so important to the recruiting operation and rallying the donors and all that, that it makes a huge difference. Like, I think that's as fascinating as anything is like, we all know what the importance of an all-time great coach in the context of the nineties or the two thousands, but what does that look like moving forward? I think is going to be really fascinating. Well, Michigan had 19 players invited to the NFL Combine. 19. That that tells you they lost a lot of really good players, and it also tells you how many good players they had. Michigan also has eight home games next year. Eight. You know how many home games they had this year? Eight. I don't know how they pull it off. It's unbelievable to me how they're able to do this. They don't play a road game until October 5th. Now, they will play – Texas and USC before they do play a road game, but my God, Michigan's able to able to sort of line its own coffers with money. Let's move on to Nebraska men's basketball. Okay, so we're in a bye week. The Huskers got a a must win against a bad Michigan team uh, that might fire its coach at the end of the year. Ohio State did fire its coach today. Nebraska plays them on the road here in two weeks. The Huskers play Penn State. On Saturday, uh, for folks who uh, don't listen to the to the Half Court Press podcast, I encourage you to do so because I think I think Wilson Moore and and uh, and John Walker are going to talk about NCAA tournament stuff. This this feels like kind of a good time to to do that. But Wilson came out with uh, you know we're going to have a weekly you know blog prediction thing that that comes out that people will be able to to listen to and or, or to read I should say and and the look right now is kind of on the bubble, a 10 or 11, according to ESPN, and and this seems very unlikely to me, but according to ESPN, there's a possibility that Nebraska would play in Omaha um, opposite Kansas in a bracket. I think that's just sort of a gimmick of them doing that, but maybe that's entirely possible. Um, Just general thoughts on Nebraska men's basketball at this moment in a bye week on the bubble. Yeah, I mean, Sam, it's, it's entirely possible because the, the committee doesn't do the bracket until the very last minute. It's, it's, and I, and the, and the Sunday morning before they announce it, it's, and it's, it's all formalized. And it just, it's, it's, it's by the luck of the draw. There's no, there's no agendas where we're going to do this to sell tickets. It's just total random. I know people don't want to believe that, but it's true. So that they could absolutely end up here. Um <laughs> You know, but yeah, they're they're on the amazing bubble. if it happens. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, sure it would. I mean, look what happened in fourteen. They both ended up in San Antonio together. Who the hell picked that? Nobody. Right. So these things happen. So we'll just have to sit back and watch. Um, I, they're on the bubble, and it's that non-conference schedule and doing many favors, but. They offset that by wins. The thing they got, as you know, is show consistency. They got to win 
Part of that is winning on the road. They, they got to finish. Okay, they're in position. Now you got to finish. They, I, I'm not saying they have to win out. They probably have to win out <laughs> because the wins you're getting right now aren't going to, aren't going to help you. The losses will, will definitely hurt you. So, yeah, they they they're not probably not going to win out. But the, what they need to be thinking about right now is playing their best basketball every single game, showing up every single game. Uh, Illinois, they showed up on their best games. They followed that up with uh, who knows what. Well, they can't have any more who knows what. That's true. <laughs> so, it, or they're going to be hurting. Um, I'll yeah. tell you something else, and, and I think Nebraska's an NCAA tournament team. They're a team that could win a game. I totally believe that. But they're also a team that could, that could, that could, that could fall apart here on the road and miss out. Uh, Ohio State fired their coach today. Chris Holman's gone. What's that going to be like when they go there? Indiana's, you know, the fans are very unhappy. What's that going to be like? Yeah. These, these are good situations for Nebraska. These are very – good situations um there are distractions of plenty in bloomington and columbus right now so go take advantage of it for once you know take advantage of this stuff you, you're all set up go finish it off go finish the job um but i'll tell you what husker fans you better i'm not saying you have to wear a little blue hat or you have to get your you know you know, you, you, you might have to hold your nose, but you need to be rooting for Creighton these next few weeks because Creighton plays some of your guys next to you on the bubble. Um, the Butler, bubble yeah. St. John's, uh, Seton Hall, they're all right next to you. And <laughs> if any of those teams beat Creighton, that's a hell of a win. That doesn't help Nebraska. <laughs> so – you need you need to be you need Creighton to be beaten Butler on Saturday morning. You need uh, Creighton to be beaten Seton Hall in two weeks, and uh, and I don't know what, where Villanova stands, but there's all these middle of the pack Big East teams that are right there with Nebraska, and <laughs> you know, Nebraska just needs to win and catch some breaks with other teams. So, uh, better root for Creighton. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They play all those teams. Uh, did St. John's win last night or did they lose? I, I'm they sorry. Lost. I know. They lost. They lost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's hard to win at Providence. So just, but they, so but if they go to, bad. if they go to, if they beat Creighton at home uh, in two weeks, all yeah. of a sudden they, they might, might be back. So they might. I mean, it's just, but you're in Nebraska, you can't have your eyes on everything. But, you know, they're going to need to, they're going to need to finish. And I think they'll be okay, um, but who else? Who else in the Big Ten's on the bubble? Uh, Sparty, uh, Goldie, who else? Um, I mean, there are some Big Ten teams in the middle that uh, you know. You go, you go to Minneapolis. That might get a little interesting, but generally, the the field was picked by Friday night. So, right. um, anyway. Uh, Michigan yeah, State it's, it's, and Northwestern it's, could, in theory, ha collapse down the stretch and yeah. play their way out of the tournament, but they're in right. right now. Minnesota has to play way up. I mean, they're going to have to. They, I, I would right. say Minnesota has to win out, and Nebraska can probably get away with losing one. Well, that Minnesota, it better not be to Minnesota. Right. They want to lose yeah. to those teams. If Minnesota comes into Lincoln and wins, that's that could be a game changer. So. Um, beating Penn State isn't going to get you much. Um, Indiana next week, I said, yeah, you better get that one. Agreed. You better turn that into the end of the game of the year. You know, uh, get on that airplane with um, army fatigues from Miami and all that stuff. You get game of the <laughs> year. You better you better show up with you know the old lunch bucket deal. Um, yeah, and then you know, Ohio State, same thing. So. That's the mentality you want right now, Sam. This time of year, you, you're already in the you're already in the NCAA tournament. You're already in the postseason. You know, winner out. That's a good mentality to get into. 
where every game is you got to show up. So, um, I agree. I, I like your team, and they they're, they should be in, but they're not there in yet. They got to get it. They got to they got to earn their way in. That's a there is a benefit to needing to win out all the time because you don't live in much gray, and I think there's there's very little gray there for Nebraska. They should just assume that even even if I thought they could lose one game, and I, I do think they could lose one, they should just assume what you're saying, that they they can't, they really can't, they can't really, you know, they can't lose. Uh, so we'll we'll see what happens. They play Penn State on Saturday. Uh, Penn State was a great team last year. They're so-so this year. They're uh, kind of rebuilding. One thing I'll say, there's going to be 18 teams in Big Ten basketball next year. It won't surprise me. And I'm not exaggerating if there are nine new head coaches. And I, I don't think Fred Hoiberg will be different. I think Fred Hoiberg will be there. I, I don't think that's one that's getting switched out. I agree. But I think there's a great chance. Holtman's one. I think UCLA and Cronin. I have no idea what's going on at Washington. But, um, you know, Dana Holtman's probably near the end. I mean, he could be retiring. Uh, he, and then you've got, you know, the job at Michigan. How, how could Juwan Howard come back? I, I, I don't really know how. Then there's some other jobs. So there's I, some rumors, I think there's, there's go there's ahead. some rumors about Iowa. Your retirement. Right. Well earned. I mean, right. he's, he's had a heck of a run there at Iowa. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of turnover and Nebraska actually will be well suited to, in my opinion, to just stick with what they've got. Uh, and and their staff and their coach because I think the stability might benefit them in this in what's going to be a crazy offseason. Okay, let's go to baseball. Uh, Nebraska baseball starts its journey toward uh, what an NCAA regional bid. I think that's probably a reasonable goal. The Huskers play three uh, down in Arlington at the Rangers' new stadium, right, Evan? That's right. Okay, and sh- uh, shoot me the order of the games. Who they play? One, two, three. Baylor Friday, number twenty one, Texas Tech on Saturday, and Oklahoma Sunday. And who and Texas Tech is the best of those three? Yes. All right. So Nebraska starts with three really good non conference games, RPI builders. They don't have net rankings yet in baseball. Uh so these are RPI builders. These are the games that you kind of gotta win. They help out later on. Uh Nebraska baseball is giving itself a challenge to start. Um, you've already laid out in a couple of stories who their starting rotation is going to be, but we will begin broadly um, with 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 our little preview section here for a few minutes. When you think about this team uh, and some of the players that it lost and some of the players that it gained, why will the 2024 team potentially be different from the 2022 and 2023 teams that failed to make the NCAA tournament? I think it, if if that happens, it's because players twenty one through forty this year are better than players twenty one through forty the last couple of years. Now it's it's kind of strange, right? Because everyone looks at at the starting nine and your weekend rotation, and I think in this moment, objectively, Nebraska has taken a step back there. I mean, they're they're Friday and Saturday guys from last year were top ten round draft picks. Their middle infield made what, $6 million in, in signing money and in the top two rounds. Uh, they're not going to approach 97 home runs, a school record that they hit a year ago. But when you look at what sunk Nebraska last year, especially, and two years ago was was just, you know, it just didn't come together. They didn't even make the Big Ten tournament. And that was, you know, just, come, it, it, it wasn't a good season. But last year, I thought it was a lot more instructive of, yeah, you can have, a pretty good draft haul and Nebraska did. They had their best draft haul in 15 years, but they were out of the at-large conversation by early to mid-April. And that's because they couldn't take care of the midweek. They couldn't close out on Sundays. They didn't know how they were going to cover the sixth, seventh, eighth innings in a tight game after they've used their top couple of arms out of the bullpen. And I think that's where, some of the difference comes in is uh, just with the the freshmen that they added, a number of junior college players. Uh, that's where the strength is going to be. Like you're going to be able to go eight, nine guys deep, at least on paper and from what they've seen in the off season and confidently believe they're going to get the job done. You're going to have a Tuesday night where you don't have to literally draw a name out of a hat as to who's going to start 
and hope they can give you more than an inning or two. Like it's going to be different. And there are reasons for that um, from an NIL perspective, from the Alston money that Nebraska can give players that other schools don't, from pitchers wanting to work with Rob Childress. Like there are reasons to believe that they do have that depth, but that's where it comes in because, you know, like you said, Nebraska can go to Texas this weekend and have a great weekend and they can lose all that progress. If they drop a game to Omaha, if they drop a game to North Dakota state, like that cancels all of that out. So I think that's where it comes in. It's just the depth uh, that they have beyond just maybe the starters. Okay. Let's ask very quickly about the pitching. Um, Obviously, you know, what we tend to see is the very best teams in college baseball are really good there that's that i mean they're good hitting teams but they're really good uh in their staff um certainly wake forest has put a lot of energy and money into that that you know they were in my opinion the second best team last year lsu was the best team and of course they they just bought a bunch of guys and they were really good but they had great stats great arms deep arms all the rest w- what do you think of nebraska's pitching who are the the front line guys and then who are the guys that you would describe as high leverage arms uh, in the back back end? Yeah, I mean, the starting rotation, I was a little surprised, quite honestly, with what they put out there. I thought Drew Christo would be there. I guess he wasn't feeling 100%, so he's not in that role in the opening weekend. Brett Sears is your Friday guy. He's an interesting one because he he dominated over the summer in the Northwoods League. Like, like he was the best pitcher by far out there. Uh, he'd always been a starter in his college career and was pretty good. And Nebraska used him as a reliever last year. And and he has said, and the coaches have said that maybe that wasn't the best move. He's he's just for whatever reason better prepared as a starter. So he's going to get that chance. Will Walsh was the guy who jumped in as a as a Sunday guy midway through last year. He's their most experienced guy back in that role. Uh, and then Caleb Clark, who, if people remember, was a starter the first few weekends as a true freshman last year. Didn't really do well in any of them. Went to the bullpen and struggled there too. And and we didn't really hear from him the rest of the year. Uh, you know, Bolt said last year he was maybe operating with like one and a half pitches per every game he was going out. Now he's got three good ones. And I think some of that is because he's working with children. So that's where they're starting. I, th- I think though that the strength of this team is going to be in the bullpen. I think, you know, Nebraska fans are sort of accustomed to this idea that, man, you need your Friday and Saturday guys to give you six innings to save the bullpen before you turn it over. I think this team, the formula might be have the starter give you four or five and then take kind of a relay approach the rest of the way, because they have, yeah, I think a close to 40 saves on their roster from guys who've gotten saves at other college stops. Right. Rand Sanders, Kyle Fralick are newcomers, Evan Borst, Casey Dice is going to be the closer to start. So they have, I think more options on the back end there. And so it's going to be more of a collective approach as opposed to maybe the last few years when they've relied on guys like Cade Povich or Emmett Olson. I don't, and maybe that guy will emerge, but right now it seems like it's going to be more of a, uh, you know, collective effort here, maybe than just a a few superstars. In the lineup and in the field, Um, obviously Swanson is back. He, he's going to be one of the best hitters in the big 10, maybe the best hitter in the big 10. What else does Nebraska bring to the table? And okay. So yeah, you want to, you want to throw strikes. I agree with that. Let's get the ball over the plate. Don't give anybody free passes, but you have to have a defense behind that if you're going to throw strikes. Do they have a defense behind them? I think it'll be better. Yeah. I mean, for all that Bryce Matthews did last year as a hitter, his defense uh, at times was erratic. And I think that's going to improve with Dylan Carey sliding over from third to short. He's the only guy back in that infield. It's going to be a much different looking group. You got Josh Overbeek, who's a switch hitter at third. Uh, you may have a true freshman in Case Sanderson playing first base a good amount of the time. Caden Brumbaugh is a guy who transferred from Oklahoma State a year ago who was hurt all of last year. He's going to be the guy at second. Husker fans will remember the catchers, Josh Karen and Ben Columbus. And I think they'll remember the outfielders too. Uh, you mentioned Swanson, um, Garrett Anglum's back, Cole Evans. And then their new center fielder is going to be uh, Riley Silva, who's a, a transfer Game-changing speed. He's going to cover a lot of ground in center. He's going to push the envelope uh, as a bunter and a base stealer and that sort of thing. So I I think they're really strong up the middle defensively. That's where you want to start, obviously, when you're talking about baseball defense. Um, But, yeah, you're going to see probably about half the lineups different this year. They have more left-handers than they've had probably in the last seven or eight years just in terms of being able to go lefty-righty. So I think there's some more versatility there. there, You're not going to see the home runs, like I said, as much. 
that's just not going to be, I don't think, the game of this offense. But you're going to see him put pressure on defense and, and steal bases, hit and runs, things of that nature. Mm. All right, so this question is is also for Tom. Um, and I may actually start with him if he has a thought. Uh, you know, Will Bolt had the first year didn't count. It was a COVID year. Uh, they barely played. His second year is this explosive surprise of a season where they they take Arkansas to the regional final. Uh, take them really to the last two innings of that game, number one, Arkansas. Uh, everybody thinks, okay, here we go. Uh, it's rock and roll time. They, you know, they, uh, they were going to get better in 22 and then in 23, and then they don't make the tournament. So technically he's in his fifth year, but actually he's in his fourth. Is this, is this a NCAA tournament, you know, or we got to have a conversation kind of year for Will Bolt? Oh, I don't know. I I, I want to see, I mean, I think it would have to be really bad for that to happen. Um, yeah, I, I think they, they they need to go to the tournament, uh, but uh, I still like the players he's he's recruiting. I, I still like Bolt. I, I think he's he he has the it factor, um, but they've had they've had certainly uh, their, their share of injuries. Um, uh, the, the the weekly non conference wins. I think they they. They, they they lost focus in some of those. They didn't take them as seriously. Um, I think they 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 needed the reset. I don't know. Sam. I'm I'm not anxious to throw him throw him out. Oh sure, you know, right. A, a young guy. I, I want to give him a little a little a little runway to learn how to be a head coach. Um, um, because I I still see him as a young Dave Van Horn. Maybe I'm maybe maybe that's the wrong way to look at it. But I've I, I always seen him as a a vital part of the Van Horn culture. And I think he has the it factor, uh, but you got to have players. You got to have pitchers. I'm really anxious to see the Rob Childress factor. You know, him, now that he's going to be all in, you know, not just the guy on the end of the bench hanging around. Um, you know, when, when he's vested and he's involved and he's, you know, he's a guy that, I can, I, can, I, can, I can have a major impact on the attitude of the team. And, and frankly, the Nebraska needs that attitude. They need it from Bolt. They need it from Childress. And that's how they always won games. Uh, they didn't always have the best players, but they made plays. They they outperformed you. They they were, they were going to outwork you, and they, they were just competitive SOBs. And they need to get back to that. And um, now they didn't have that last year. So I'm intrigued by the, the pitching and defense is a, a good place to start. Um, sometimes when you rely too much on the the two big boppers, you kind of sit back and wait. And it's better to not have them, I think, and when you have to go out and, 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 and uh, you know, make your own energy, you know, make your own um, – you know, action. You go out there and, and and take the game with the other team, and so maybe that that's what they're going to get back to here. And I think it's um, certainly setting up well. Expectations are not high. Um, I was kind of the team in the Big Ten. They come to Lincoln, um, but I think there's a lot that there's a lot going on in Lincoln. Uh, I think they could have a pretty good year. But uh, do I, am I expecting hosting and uh, super regionals? No, I'm not expecting that at all. But I'll be happy to be surprised. Evan, um, you know, if if uh, the, the star players aren't, aren't there and what they have now is a little bit more of a blue-collar team, do you, do you think that suits the coach's personality maybe a little bit more than the than the uh, three run homer thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Will Bolt, people remember him as a player from Nebraska. He was like one of the only guys from those teams that wasn't uh, a pro prospect. You know, everyone else went on. He he got into coaching right away. Uh, a lot of their staff is the same way. They were junior college guys, um, you know, grinders, guys like that. They weren't star players in their own right. So, yeah, I think so. And that's a 
you know, you, you, whenever you ask them about the offense, like they they want a team that just kind of stresses the defense. Like they're not going to say no to the home run, but they want to lay down bunts. They want to run out singles. They want to hit and run. They want to do all that stuff because they do feel like they can <clears throat> outwork you and, and you know, find a way to to better you as the game goes on. And like, that's, you know, you talk about is Will Bold on the hot seat. I, I, to me, when I look at a college baseball program, that's uh, has a guy in the hot seat, it's about complacency. Is there like, is there stagnation in the program? And I just, I don't see that at Nebraska. I mean, they're, they're looking at how they can improve Haymarket park. They, you know, Will Bolt essentially hired two new assistants and Childress and Mike Sirianni, the way that they were active in the portal. I think they've learned a few lessons along the way from the portal and just sort of the new climate of college baseball. They're doing things a little differently than they did a couple of years ago. So like all that to me says like, there's a fire to win, um, you know, Childress people may forget was a head coach in the big 12 and the sec at Texas A&M. He made the regionals every year. He was a CWS qualifier. And Great now, he, and now he, yeah, he's like, you know, he, he's part of the deal. He's all in, he's on the field. So like, they have the experience. I think they have the motivation <clears throat> and now it's just a matter of how it translates. One, one note to make, um, they only play UNO once this year and they only play South Dakota state once and they only play North Dakota state once. Mm -hmm. And I believe, and you tell me if I'm wrong, their annual, their annual visit with Northern Colorado here in uh, Haymarket park is off the schedule too. I believe that's right. Yeah. So Part of it is, I think, that they, they've replaced those games with Wichita State, two against KU. I don't know how good KU is. One against K-State, and K-State was good last year. Maybe it was two against K-State. And they have, I think, their usual three with Creighton. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I think it's a good move to have gotten some of those games off the schedule. And I'm not trying to knock those teams. After all, they beat Nebraska last year. I, I think it's getting harder and harder to motivate the kids. Uh, to to look at that game and say that game is just as important as you know the the series win that we're coming off of. I can't remember who they beat in a series last year who was pretty darn good, and then they went and lost. I think to South Dakota State. Like it's getting harder and harder to motivate the kids to uh, to get up for games that fundamentally are not against teams they're going to be facing in the NCAA tournament. And uh, early in the season, they have the three this weekend. You'll be down there. Then they go four to Grand Canyon. Don't know anything about them. They're then good. I believe they're back home. They play South Alabama or they play Nichols. You got Char College of Charleston in there. College of Charleston. So they go, right. So they go <laughs> Grand Canyon, College of Charleston. Then they're back home playing Nichols State. Uh, then I think they're out at South Alabama. So, you know, that, that that's their that's the meat of their non-conference. Um, we'll see what they do. Yes, they're at home against South Alabama. Then they take two to Wichita and they're back home against Nichols. No. And then they have a three-gamer against New Mexico State. <clears throat> Who's awful. <laughs> You're right. Right. But they, yeah. they have a they have they have a that team might be better kind of name than than Omaha. They they just do. And I wouldn't want to screw. I mean, last year UNO had 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 a couple of guys that were really good. So we'll find out what they do. Um you know, I, I don't know how many. I always think if you're going to get a non-conference, you're getting an at-large bid in the Big Ten, um, not not winning the conference tournament. You better just plan on winning 40 games. Uh, whether you, maybe you can get in there at 37 or 38, but you might as well just win 40 <laughs> to get an at-large bid. And if you want to get a regional host, you better plan on winning at least that and maybe a couple of more. So uh, that's what Nebraska would have to do in the Big Ten. Now, next year, that changes. USC, UCLA, Washington, Oregon, three of those teams can play some pretty damn good baseball. And Nebraska will have some more opportunities to play teams that can help them in the conference. Uh, but you did say Iowa's the favorite, right? They are. Yep, they have the, the best arms. They're the most proven. It can't be too many more years where Iowa's beating you on the baseball field. That They got flipped that. Got to get the series win against the Hawkeyes this year. We'll see. What happens? Okay, that's our Pick 6 podcast for this week. Uh, for Evan and Tom, I'm Sam. I will not be part of the podcast next week. It'll be Evan and Tom driving the show however they want to. Uh, I'll be out on a short vacation. Uh, so enjoy what we're talking about, and they'll be here next week to chat with you. Thanks, husband fans.